Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. So we're very happy to have uh, Ayush Jain with us from NT Research talking about obfuscation and learning. Take it away. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about indistinguishability of obfuscation and learning problems. So one of the really nice thing about uh, this relationship between learning theory and uh, cryptography is this unique kind of relationship of symbiosis. What we as cryptographers do, we take many of your learning uh, problems which have been studied for a very long time and for which we don't know optimal algorithms yet. And we sometimes turn them into extremely powerful and surprising uh, cryptographic primitives. At the same time, in order uh, for our search for those kind of primitives, we also come up with new conjectures, new problems on which you can kind of base security upon. And that's, that serves as a um, really nice test bench for some of those algorithms. So today in this, uh, Talk, I'm going to talk about indistinguishability of obfuscation. And uh, it's a really versatile and um, powerful and fundamentally really basic object, which has received a lot of attention over the last 10 years or so. And uh, I'm going to tell you how underlying the security notions are hard problems, which have deep connections to learning theory. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first, let's start by defining what is indistinguishability of obfuscation. At its roots, it was kind of implicitly mentioned in 1976 in the work of Diffie and Hellman, but really the kind of main thrust came through the work uh, in Barak et al, 2001. What does it say? Uh, it's asking for something really basic. Let's say you have a program and uh, you can think of it as a Boolean circuit for, for the rest of the talk. And what, uh, and, uh, what you're asking for is kind of a compiler, which I'm going to denote by in, in IO. What does it do? It's a polynomial time compiler. It outputs another program. Uh, think of it as a circuit again. Um, this uh, this uh, resulting circuit should basically have the same input output behavior, meaning, meaning that this compiler shouldn't change the functionality. Uh, it could be at least uh, at most polynomially slower. But we, what we are really looking for in this resulting circuit is some kind of unintelligibility guarantees about the implementation details uh, of uh, the initial program, okay? And uh, the way IO captures it is by asking that this uh, compiler enable hiding implementation differences. So how do you formalize that? Um, think of two programs, pi and lambda, and let's say they satisfy this premise of being functionally equivalent. What does this functionally equivalent means? It means that, uh, that these two programs have the same input output behavior, uh, and they all have, also have the same circuit size. This is just some common sense requirement. Uh, but what could be different? The different could be, you know, how they are actually implemented and their gate topology and so on and so forth. So what I say is, is that if you have two programs, pi and lambda, and let's say they uh, satisfy this premise, once I IO them, uh, what I should get are two programs that are hard to um, distinguish or tell apart by a computationally bounded or polynomial time uh, algorithm. Okay, so just this basic guarantee. So in the sense it's hiding implementation differences and just to kind of uh, drive away the point home, uh, think of pi as being the bubble sort program and Lambda being the selection sort program. Both of these programs are the kind of sorting uh, circuits. Um, their functionality is identical, but their implementations are different. So I would say is uh, if I obfuscate, let's say bubble sort and give it to you, you won't be able to tell me for sure whether it was bubble sort or selection sort or some other uh, sorting process. Okay, so now if you kind of uh, uh, stare it for a while, it may not be even clear why uh, just hiding implementation differences is the most theoretical, th theoretically optimal kind of unintelligibility guarantee that you can ever hope for in any you know, uh, unintelligibility compiler that I mentioned. Um, but turns out this, this took us quite some time. It's only in 2007 when the work of uh, Goldwasser and Rothblum proved that, you know, IO is the best possible definition that you can ever hope to realize. So, and indeed, uh, even in application standpoint, we have seen by no exaggeration, hundreds of results since uh, the first work in 2014. Today, we know that almost all known cryptographic primitives, and I'm using almost all uh, cryptographic primitives, uh, today can be constructed using IO and additionally assuming some kinds of uh, other standard crypto. So not only classical primitives, which we knew how to do otherwise, um, you can build some un unimaginable like super powerful primitives, which people did not even consider uh, before IO came. 
because the kind of guarantees that they were asking for is just like you too much uh, to be to hope for. Um, and it's really versatile, uh, a single primitive implying so many different things. So, you know, let's ask if it's so useful what has been done uh, in the community in terms of construction. And here too, there have been lots and lots of work. The first uh, construction came only in 2013, which is a candidate construction. And since then, there have been many, many constructions, new proposals, new conjectures, uh, and then the security is based on those conjectures, and then there are cycles of breaks and repair. So this has really seen uh, a lot of work. Um, and up until very recently, we actually did not even know if it's feasible to realize IO uh, based on some well-studied or uh, reasonably well-believed kind of hard problem. So it was all kind of uh, uh, open and this, you know, just tremendous amount of work. I can't even hope to cover all of that in detail, but very broadly speaking, uh, there are two kinds of uh, lines that have been uh, emerging out. One line is kind of unique in the way that uh, in the sense that they rely on what is known as elliptic curve cryptography, which I'm sure some of you might have heard that many of the known uh, public encryption schemes which are used today in like practice actually rely on elliptic curve cryptography. This line uh, recently in a you know, joint work with uh, Rachel Lynn and Amit Sahai, we can show that you can construct IO based on three kind of computational problems. Uh, and two of them have a nice uh, learning theoretic feel to it. Uh, First problem is existence of Boolean PRGs in NC0. Um, uh, so Benny actually mentioned about this in, in his talk. This is actually deeply related to the notion of random CSPs. Uh, the second problem is the notion uh, of learning parity with noise over ZP, which is exactly very closely related with uh, decoding random linear codes with sparse noise. And third, of course, is elliptic curve cryptography. So what's nice about uh, this is now that uh, we have some sort of confidence in the feasibility of this uh, uh, primitive, if you assume that these kind of problems are hard. Um, however, what's, what's actually annoying and unfortunate that uh, one of the assumptions we make, which is the existence of uh, hard elliptic uh, groups, turns out actually that's broken in quantum polynomial time, simply due to period finding or Shor's algorithm and things like that. So this line cannot uh, hope to give uh, uh, a post-quantum secure construction unless we get rid of uh, elliptic curve cryptography and from the list. On the other hand, there's another uh, kind of direction. What's so nice about them is they don't, do not rely on any uh, kind of groups at all and only rely on certain kind of lattice decoding problems. New, but uh, they're entirely lattice-based problems. So, it's possible that one day we might be able to construct IO, uh, which is post-quantum secure, entirely relying on, uh, on lattices, okay? Um, now this has also seen a lot of work. Last one year or so has been uh, really prolific in this kind of work. There have been five constructions and one work which kind of analyzed some of those uh, proposals. Uh, what's so nice about this kind of line is that recently we have been seeing some kind of emergence of a common high level structure in, on, on those new kind of problems. And typically it ends up being some kind of interaction between learning with error, which is a really well-known cryptographic problem. Uh, along with that, uh, there are some uh, structured leakages on the errors of those LWE sample. And typically this ends up being some kind of low degree polynomial. Okay, uh, and the whole ball game here is to exactly identify what kind of uh, simplest possible low degree polynomials suffice for constructing indistinguishability obfuscation. And at the same time uh, can, can be analyzed using learning uh, algorithms in like uh, learning theory and other kinds of algorithms, which, which are typically studied to cryptanalyze uh, systems. So this is really new and exciting. Um, lots of work needs to be done. Holy grail here is, of course, if you could construct IO entirely on some kind of lattice assumption without any kind of leakage, what's actually really important that we identify clean uh, conjectures and then study them using current framework of algorithms uh, and reason about them. And this is one place where I would feel that there will be an avenue for collaboration between the two communities. So that's all I'll say about these two lines. Today in this talk, I'm going to focus on two problems namely Boolean PRGs and NC0 and learning parity with noise over ZP. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't be able to cover the, the 
the other line, although I'm really excited about them and I'm happy to talk up offline about some of the key kind of issues that arise in these constructions. Okay, so let's start with uh, our first uh, problem, Boolean PRGs in NC0. And um, so what are Boolean PRGs in NC0? They're extremely simple Boolean functions. What do they do? They take n bits of input. So, so they take n bits of input and they, they have uh, m outputs and where m is actually more than n and actually for to be useful to IO, it needs to be actually polynomial in n. So you're looking at polynomially expanding Boolean functions. And we also need these functions to be evaluatable by, by constant depth circuits. So every output bit can only depend on a constant number of input bits and that's called the locality. What we are really looking for is cryptographic security. We want that when the PRGG uh, is evaluated at a random input X, this should be computationally indistinguishable to random string uh, R uh, of length M. Uh, now, typically in, in the learning world, uh, the, the, it's, it's important to kind of specify what kind of definition we are hoping for. So what we are really hoping for is that for every polynomial time attacker, uh, probability that adversary takes this G of X and outputs one uh, minus the probability that adversary um, and polynomial time attacker takes a random string of length M and outputs uh, one, this should be really cryptographically small. And by cryptographically small, I mean extremely small, sub-exponential in n, so two to the minus n to this constant for some constant. And this is where I want to kind of stress some differences which arise in typical learning settings and our setting. We are trying to do, show this for every possible polynomial time attacker unless, uh, uh, and not some restricted class. And also the kind of dist distinguishing probability we're shooting for is two to the minus n to the omega of one, whereas typical learning PRGs uh, also consider, where, where this uh, unconditional PRGs also consider settings where this is inverse polynomial. So this problem has been you know, studied for a long time. Uh, I'm sure you heard Benny's talk and he was mentioning this at a great bit of detail. Um, at least 20 years, we have seen lots of, lots of different candidates and what kind of uh, algorithms that go into building it. So today in this talk, what we're going to do, we're going to look at these Boolean PRGs in NC0. And I'm gonna show that how the current known uh, uh, constructions are heavily inspired for, from the notion of random CSPs, but then how things starts to change and how, what are the other kind of additional issues that we have to deal with, which typically do not arise in the CSP settings, and then what else needs to be done. Okay, by the way, if there are any questions, please just stop me and uh, ask away. So how do you build a uh, candidate Boolean PRGs in NC0? Uh, the most popular paradigm, in fact, that's the only one I'm aware of, is uh, this general recipe by Goldreich in 2001, which was actually to construct uh, one-way one functions, but actually this also um, is, is a res reasonable recipe to build uh, PRGs. So what does it say? Uh, a Goldreich PRG is actually indexed, kind of parameterized by two things. One of them is a Boolean predicate, and it's a balanced predicate, uh, meaning half of the inputs go to zero, half of the inputs go to one, and it only depends on some constant number of bits. And then there is a hypergraph, there's a bipartite graph. How is this bipartite graph chosen? Well, there are on the left set of verses, I'm going to just write one through N, which are the nodes, N is the number of inputs. On the right-hand sides, uh, we have uh, M kind of uh, vertices. Each of them are connected to uh, D of the left vertices. Uh, and you can also write it in a hypergraph notation, S1 through SM. M corresponds to the number of output bits that you are hoping for. Now, how is this graph chosen? Typically, it's chosen at random. Uh, all it needs to do is satisfy some kind of expansion. At least it needs to satisfy some kind of expansion guarantees. And uh, that is very specific to exact uh, D, exact M, and all those kind of things, which I'm not going to cover. Uh, you heard all of that in Benny's talk, but um, the idea is that it, it needs to be an expander and therefore some sort of conditions need to be satisfied. Uh, and if it's randomly chosen with very good probability, it ends up being an expander. Okay, so now once you have this graph and this predicate, you can define this function, which is indexed with the predicate and the graph, uh, which takes an input X and it outputs uh, M bits, Y1 through YM. And each uh, yi is computed by applying the predicate p on the inputs corresponding to the set uh, si. So this is the ith output bit. Uh, and then the PRG conjecture says 
if you choose this uh, predicate p pop properly for whatever pro properly means, uh, and if the graph has some nice combinatorial properties, then uh, eh, this uh, function is going to yield a secure PRG. So now from what you saw, this figure, uh, this, this drawing that I drew should be very reminiscent of kind of structure that arises in CSP as well. In a random CSP, uh, it's actually associated with the same kind of, uh, um, it's really similar in that setting. The, the apparatus is very, very similar. So it's very um, natural that you might want to use some of the results that you, you have studied uh, random CSPs for a very, very long time. You might want to use them in order to construct uh, a PRG. So let's you know dive a little bit on uh, this intuition. So let's say you have a random uh, CSP, how, how is it defined? Again, the same apparatus, there is a hypergraph uh, H with delta and edges where delta is the constraint density. Again, this is, there's a balanced constant local predicate P which takes d bits and outputs one bit and uh, think of d greater than or equal to three. Then uh, random CSP typically is associated with two kinds of distribution. The first one is planted. In a planted distribution, what do you do? You sample an input x star from zero one to the n at random. Then you're going to issue m constraints. Uh, one constraint for every uh, set si. Okay, so how is it each constraint generated? You're going to sample a random negation pattern, CI from zero, one to D, and you're going to choose a Boolean variable flip, uh, which is the probability which we, I will flip the constraint. Uh, typically it's chosen from Bernoulli distribution with a tiny probability row, which is a constant. And then you can generate each constraint by giving out CI along with a value BI, which consists of uh, the predicate P applied on the bits of X star corresponding to the set SI, but then uh, flipped according to the negation pattern. And then uh, you will, you're going to perturb the sample with the uh, event flip I that you just sampled. So this is the planted distribution. Uh, and then there is a random distribution where you don't uh, choose any planted input at all. You simply output CI and, uh, and a random uh, value RI chosen obliviously of any uh, planted input. So this is the setting of random CSP and you, you study a variety of problems. Uh, concerning this, uh, all kind of dealing with this notion of optimum, where, um, where you want to find out, so optimum is the objective, which is the maximum number of constraints that can be satisfied by any given X, uh, any given input X. So then you, uh, you for just to kind of make some observation in the planted case, uh, the number of constraints that you can satisfy is one minus rho times M with very high probability. Uh, in the, in the random case, uh, if M is large enough, you can never hope for uh, more than 0.5 fraction uh, of the assignments by being satisfied by any input if M is large enough. Right. Rho is the probability of flipping. And that's why this row comes in. The, the, yeah. So uh, you can ask a variety of question. In the search uh, problem, you're trying to find the planted assignment. Uh, and then on the other hand, which is the exactly opposite of uh, doing search, uh, you, what you're trying to show is that if I take a random uh, instance, not you're, going to, you're trying to give a proof that not too many of those uh, can be simultaneously satisfied by any given X. So it's a, uh, it's, you, you're going to write a proof. And typically this entails that you're going to try to come up with an algorithm R, uh, which is a refuter, which has the following guarantee. First, it needs to take as input uh, the, the CSP and it, it should output an upper bound uh, on the number of constraints that can be satisfied by any given input. Uh, but then in, to ensure non-triviality, you're going to ask that with some constant probability, for example, the value it outputs needs to be less than one minus delta, where delta is some constant again. So this is called, uh, called as delta refutation. Okay, so, uh, and then there is another uh, version of the problem, which is, uh, distinguishing, which you would believe is easier than the two. Here, you are trying to just distinguish between the planted and the random case. So now all the three problems have been studied for, for a long time. And there's some kind of intuition that all of these problems should be hard if you set the parameters uh, appropriately. So it's trivial to see that the search and the refutation versions 
is easier than distinguishing. You can make a very simple distinguisher by if you have a, a algorithm that succeeds in either search or refutation. On the other hand, what's, so, what's even surprising is that under some parameters, uh, distinguishing turns out to be as hard as search. So if you have a like a reasonably powerful distinguisher, you can use it uh, to, to also do search. I'm going to refer you to Benny's talk because he talked about it in a bit of uh, detail, more detail. So all these problems are supposed to be in kind of a roughly intuitively same kind of a hardness class. And in fact, this has been looked for a long time. Uh, Feige gave his famous hypothesis where he said that when uh, the number of uh, constraints is like constant time sent for, for large enough constant, then there is a no, no polynomial time refutation algorithm for random three set. And as of now, this is far from uh, being refuted as, as much as I know. Uh, and today, the, there are explicit examples of predicates uh, for which the best known algorithms, in fact, take sub exponential time um, when m is let some polynomial in n. And kind of if m is even as large as n to the d over 2 minus epsilon, the best known algorithms today are sub exponential for those predicates. So, which means that you know CSPs have been studied for a long time. You, it's very intuitive that you might want to build PRGs starting from that intuition. So our goal is to kind of take an appropriate version of CSP, kind of um, massage it into a construction of for, of for PRG. And remember, we are hoping to uh, get polynomial stretch. So before we you know proceed further, let me kind of uh, point out some uh, high-level issues uh, which are not big deal, but we still need to address them. One of the issues is that typically uh, what we want, we, went, we want a PRG with a very small, cryptographically small advantage, distinguishing probability. This you cannot hope in general from CSPs, from ra random CSPs, but just because um, so it turns out when you choose the graph at random uh, with inverse polynomial probability, it'll turn out to be an extremely bad graph which will trivially make this uh, problem very easy. For example, it might happen that the set S1, which is the first uh, constraint set, uh, turns out to be equal with, uh, to S2 with very noticeable probability. And therefore, the first two constraints might end up being correlated. So this is uh, an issue. But typically, this is easy to deal with. Uh, we, will, we will ensure that uh, we, we kind of give these guarantees only when the graph is uh, nice, which will happen with very large probability uh, close to one when the graph is chosen at random. So we're going to, from, from whatever I'm going to say, uh, think of the graph being chosen from nice enough distribution. Second issue is how do I select the, uh, which balance predicate to use? The answer to this question is really simple. You're going to choose DXR. And why is that? Uh, the reason is uh, actually really nice. Turns out when, when, we, con con when we consider refutations, um, DXR is actually as hard as any other CSPs under certain class of refutation algorithm. And the reason is extremely simple again. So you're going to consider a predicate uh, P. Uh, let's say it's K local, so it depends on K outputs. Then the claim is that, um, you know, you do simple kind of uh, uh, for analysis of uh, Fourier analysis of Boolean functions, you can show that there will exist a subset S of K. Um, let's say the size of that set is D such that the predicate actually ends up being correlated with the, uh, with the linear term corresponding to the set S, and the correlation is actually more than two to the minus K over two. This you can show using simple analysis of Boolean functions. And the point of this is that once you have this, no matter what CSP you start, uh, start with, you can uh, transform the planted uh, instance where there are one minus row fraction satisfied constraints into a DXR instance, which, uh, which has about 0.5 plus two to the minus k over two satisfied constraints. Therefore, if you could you know, do a strong refutation, very powerful refutation for DXR, it will let you do uh, a weak refutation for P. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so, um, so which means that DXR is a really nice uh, starting predicate for our journey of uh, exploration on how to you know, try and build PRGs from CSPs. So it turns out random DXRs have been studied for a long time and many also mentioned in a great bit of detail. So I'm not going to spend too much time. There have been lots of uh, CSP. I'm, I'm going to call all these classes of algorithm as conventional CSP algorithms. 
uh, have been studied for a long time. And what's nice about these algorithms is that they typically have this threshold behavior. Uh, what's this threshold behavior? It so turns out that if I set M to be slightly more than N to the D over two, then all of these algorithms, uh, then these algorithms end up breaking the, the, uh, uh, the CSPs. Uh, but when I reduce the number of samples from N, N to the D, over, D by two to, to a tiny amount, let's say N to D over two minus epsilon, then these all of these um, problems uh, exhibit hardness. All of these algorithms exhibit hardness, and the best known algorithms take some exponential time. And what's also very nice is that they don't even care about the noise. So if our planted uh, input uh, had no noise, it would have uh, the, these kind of algorithms still fail in order to give a secure instance. So the, in order to break an instance of a CSP. So which means uh, our first candidate is just noiseless DXR and let's try and see what happens. So now if I, uh, uh, you can already see the problem here. If I choose my predicate to be X1 through XT, which is the DXR, uh, this, you cannot hope to construct a secure PRG out of this because our biggest worry is, uh, is just a very simple algorithm of Gaussian elimination. Uh, so it's really uh, you know, prone to algebra. And why did this did not apply in the case of CSPs was just uh, because we had this flipping variable where we were trying, we were at random flipping those equations. And uh, those turns out that flip actually just throws out all the algebraic attacks uh, in the water and we don't have to worry about them. However, uh, what we are trying to do here, we do not have this additional noise to play with or to design our PRG. Our goal is to construct new randomness, not to use that randomness to make our uh, instance secure. And this turns out to be really, really hard. In fact, most cryptographic uh, proposals that are proposed for like various kinds of constructions, typically they, uh, they, they're, when they are broken, they're, it's always, or most of the times it's always algebra. It's never, it's very rare to see uh, a sophisticated algorithm like uh, sum of squares, which ends up uh, uh, attacking these uh, these assumptions. Okay, so how do you uh, get around this? The idea, which which has been ex actually existence existing since uh, two thousand three, uh, is that we use this uh, nonlinear term um, inside the predicate, and the hope is that this kind of mimics uh, or does what exactly the CSP noise does uh, for this case for the case of CSPs. Okay, and uh, now if we can choose this nonlinear predicate so that uh, you, you can take care of algebraic attacks, that will mean like we have found a nice candidate for PRG. So in the rest of this talk, we're going to exactly uh, see how to choose this nonlinear predicate so that you can uh, rule out a certain kind of algebraic attacks. Okay, so, uh, okay, so just to kind of take the message home, uh, so this is our predicate. And now uh, what we are trying to do, uh, we are going, trying to observe how to choose the nonlinear predicate. And note that uh, just because I have this linear term here, uh, the previous uh, algorithms from the CSP algorithms uh, suit, uh, they, they kind of fail even when M is chosen at large as N to the D over two minus epsilon. And by fail, I mean, uh, I'm looking for a polynomial time algorithm to solve this. Okay, so now uh, our goal is to find this nonlinear predicate so, so that uh, you can prove security against algebraic attacks. And in our, in our goal, we'll try to, we'll try to see how you can cho choose nonlinear predicates so that the stretch is at least polynomial because that's what we need for IO. But ideally we would like to support a stretch of N to the constant times D. One should be able to choose this tunable parameter D and just get as much stretch as they want. Okay, and ideally we'd like to touch even N to the D over two because that's what the CSP, like that's what the bound we have from the other uh, set of algorithms. Okay, so before we you know, even start to understand how to pick this predicate, we must understand what algebraic attacks have been studied and you know, how do you even capture them? So it turns out there are kind of two kinds of attacks. One of them is linear bias attacks which captures the notion uh, of uh, distinguisher, which are computed with, uh, which only take like linear combinations of the outputs of the PRG. So here the goal of the adversary is to find um, a combination, which I'm good, going to denote by test. And uh, the, the, the test should be such that when uh, someone XORs 
the combination correspond to uh, that test, those combinations, in expectation should be biased in probability because this shouldn't happen when the outputs are random. And in order to you know, bypass those attacks or prove guarantee against those attacks, you prove that the, the function is a small bias generator in which you have to prove that once you fix the graph and the predicate, then for, with, for every such combination, all of those combinations that adversity can ever come up with, it should happen that XR of those outputs, if at all they are biased, the bias should not be more than sub exponential in n. So it shouldn't be more than two to the minus n to the constant for some constant. So that's what we are trying to prove. We are, I want to emphasize that it's for every such test that you can, adversary can come up with. So for a long time, it was thought that, you know, these are the only kinds of attacks that one has to worry about. And when it comes to algebra, uh, this changed in 2016, where uh, the work of Applebaum and Lovett, uh, they showed a new class of attacks, which, realizes, which utilizes polynomial uh, calculus system. And the idea was they crucially made use of uh, high degree algebraic manipulations on the, on, the, on the PRG outputs to derive new and new equations. And then uh, using algebraic refutations, they were able to uh, attack a version of uh, PRG, which was actually known to be unbroken using linear bias. So it, it just strictly proves that this is a new class of attacks, which, which we hadn't considered before. And typically in order to you know, argue security against such attacks, what you want to do, you want to prove algebraic refutation lower bounds. So now we're going to, you know, identify some of the key properties of the nonlinear predicate, so that you know you can uh, prove uh, security against these two kinds of uh, uh, attacks. And typically, these proofs are really combinatorial; they rely on properties of the predicate as well as the graph, uh, and uh, and uses techniques from analysis of Boolean functions and all those things. Uh, so we are going to study at, on a very high level. Of course, I can't go in detail and uh, how exact those proofs work, but I'm going to uh, give you a, some kind of intuition. And this intuition is not only important in, in the case of PRGs, uh, this is kind of a general problem in the sense that many a times when we uh, devise new crypto systems and new assumptions, we need to analyze all these things, which uh, becomes hard owing to the fact that these proofs are extremely combinatorial and extremely specific to the problem. So one of the open problems I'm going to like pitch uh, is this, you know, uh, if you could understand uh, or make this, uh, make this kind of line really clean so that one can simply come up with an assumption and say that, uh, you know, th this, this satisfy these, these criteria and, and uh, therefore it's kind of immune to algebraic attacks. Okay, so let's look at uh, linear attacks. And just to recall, this is what we want to do. How do you choose nonlinear predicate? Well, the first guess, let's pick any predicate of your choice. Just, just, just take any nonlinear predicate, what you want, whatever you want. Does this give you any, any sort of small bias generator? And the answer to that question is uh, partially yes, in the sense that if uh, the number of outputs is n to the 1.25, then you can actually provably show that this uh, will behave like a small bias generator. Okay. Now remember, we wanted to get a stretch of uh, n to the constant times d for some for, for some constant. Is this possible? The answer to that is that not with arbitrary predicate of your choice. Because if I choose a predicate uh, n l which has low degree, let's say constant, uh, then I can't hope security when m is greater than n to the c because of linearization. Why do you why do you want n to the omega d? Like what you know? Why can't you just come? You can just usually compose PRGs and then you get yeah. You you you'll get a squared uh, trade off. You want you I think you'll get if if you want uh, if you compose d times you will get something like n to the root of d. I'm just asking for optimality. Uh, what what's the optimum you could do? Because uh, the, the, at least in the CSP world we have this very sharp threshold. Uh, n to the d over two broken, and then before that it's like secure. We want to just do kind of kind of same kind of uh, okay. reasoning about okay. this. That's reasonable, but just to, to get a sense of what the applications are. But for cryptographic applications, do you care about the end of the d versus? Sorry, for for cryptographic applications, do you care about the end of the d versus just polynomial stretch, or I, this is just to get worry yeah. about optimality, which is also important. I'm aware of only one example where the optimality was important. So in, in our construction uh, in Eurocrypt 21 on, um, on IO, 
uh, we required a PRG with uh, with with integer degree d, integer degree. Uh, I'm not talking about the f f two degree, and the stretch needed to be more than n to the d over four. Uh, because that at that time we did not when this paper came out we did not know this new IO result that uh, I was talking about uh, so those were based on new kinds of assumptions and one of those assumptions required uh, this d by four trade off got it thanks okay so okay so uh, as I was saying if I choose non predicate to be degree c uh, you can't hope to a uh, uh, security for n to these uh, like when m is greater than equal greater than or equal to n to the c. Uh, what about, you know, how do I, so this means that a degree needs to be high. What if I choose the largest possible degree predicate where the nonlinear predicate is just product of d things. Uh, turns out, uh, let alone a uh, stretch that depends on d, it's actually broken when, uh, when there are n to the 2.1 outputs. And actually it's a really simple and acute idea by, uh, by AL16 and what do they do? They, they show that you know what you can do. You can simply collect n to the 1.1 outputs, say, such that these outputs have a common structure, namely that these outputs are uh, up computed by applying the predicate p on inputs um, bits of x corresponding to the set si, such that the set si in the nonlinear term share a variable, let's say x1. So they have a common structure with one variable in common in the nonlinear term x1. What does this mean? With 0.5 probability, if the input is chosen at random, it will happen that x1 becomes zero. And then this, these are all linear equations. So you get n to the 1.1 linear equations and uh, you can solve for x. So that was the problem. And then you can't hope for a stretch even n to the 2.1. So which means, so, so what, what went wrong? Uh, well, it turns out that it's not the, just the degree. Uh, it needs to be the bit fixing degree that needs to be high. And just to kind of define what bit fixing degree mean, I'm going to say our bit fixing degree of predicate P is E if uh, I take predicate P and over arbitrary fixing of up to, uh, until R bits of P, uh, the minimum degree I get uh, is E, okay? As an example, if I choose this as the nonlinear predicate, uh, then the one bit fixing degree of that predicate is actually one because I can substitute xd plus one as zero. And in that fixing, the degree actually becomes, it, the predicate becomes linear. So what AL showed, if uh, I have R bit fixing degree of predicate PE, then actually it's broken when uh, the number of output bits grow more than n to the R plus E. Okay, it's just the same idea. But actually what's so nice is that they showed that this is also sufficient in the sense that if R bit fixing degree of P is E where both R and E are large, then you indeed get a small bias generator supporting N to the constant times D. Okay. So as a conclusion, all you need to do is choose a nonlinear predicate with a large bit fixing degree, and you can choose majority for your nonlinear term, uh, which has D by four bit fixing degree of D by four. However, I wanna stress that in this proof, there's a huge gap. I'm hiding very big constants here in this sigma. So there's a gap, there's a big regime in which we neither know attacks nor can we prove security, at least as of now. Okay, so this is kind of also the theme which will come out later on in, in, in other kinds of PRGs. Okay, so uh, now the question remains, uh, is the small bias attacks uh, the only kind of attacks that I need to worry about when it comes to algebra? The answer to that is no. There is at least one, the polynomial calculus one. And uh, it's, a, it's also a cute insight. The idea is that think of a predicate P which has large bit fixing degree. Okay, so it has large bit fixing degree. And as a consequence of that, uh, it's small bias. But let's say, it, hypothetically speaking, it so turns out that I can find two small degree predicates Q and R, let's say their degree is E, such that when I multiply P with Q, suddenly the degree reduces to E, uh, e meaning I, I result in another predicate, which is, which is also lower degree. And as an example, uh, R is a high, high degree predicate, but when I multiply it with X1, uh, I get X1. You can see when X1 is one, both, of, both the sides are one. If X1 is zero, then both the sides are zero. So this uh, equation is kind of satisfied. 
so this is an example where this happens. So the point is, if I can find if our predicate has this property, uh, then you can form some equations like this. So you had samples y1 through ym. You can multiply it with the q, and you get r. These are algebraic equations in degree e. And now, if uh, q and r have uh, some requirements, then actually you can linearize it. But um, uh, but if, if that's not the case, AL actually uh, Applebaum and Lovett they showed that uh, um, you can do some clever arguments to uh, do polynomial refutations in general. Okay, so it cannot be secure when m is greater than uh, n to the e. Okay, by the way, uh, this degree e, which I'm going to I, I was mentioning, is actually called the rational degree, uh, the minimum degree for which you can multiply p with, so you get a lower degree polynomial r. Okay, so uh, and it's not it's not just like a, uh, like a proof thing. Actually, you can give explicit counterexamples. Consider this predicate, which has about d plus d square variables. Don't have to stare deeply on the predicate. I'm just going to explain you clearly uh, quickly. It has uh, d things in the linear term, and then it ors d things where every thing is a or of d things. Okay, so uh, it's not hard to verify that it, it has d minus one bit fixing degree d, uh, but uh, but actually it has rational degree two. Two. So that uh, so uh, so it's in fact broken when uh, in terms of algebraic attacks with n squared. Okay, so uh, here again in this algebraic kind of polynomial uh, calculus based refutations. Uh, El showed a really nice theorem showing that if the rational degree e is high, then you get a stretch of uh, n to the e uh, with respect to algebraic attacks. Okay. But here as well, there is a huge gap between what you can prove and what you can uh, what you can uh, uh, prove secure and what you can attack. And I'm going to bring exact constants in just a minute. Okay, so to summarize. How do I pick my predicate? I'm going to pick this predicate as an XOR of, uh, there's a linear term which has D things. And then I'm going to uh, XOR it with the nonlinear term. Um, and as we've already seen, uh, you know, uh, CSP algorithms are going to fail with the N to the D over two minus epsilon. Uh, how do I choose so that it's immune to algebraic attacks? It needs to have high bit fixing degree and ra high rational degree. Turns out high uh, rational just, degree. Just a question. Uh, so, do you have some intuition why there is no some some other algebraic attack? I mean, you said a union. Like, how do you yeah. define in your mind algebraic attack? Yeah, so a union? small bias attacks. It's more of a distinguisher. Uh, so what's going on is that you are uh, taking a linear combination and trying to produce um, like a term which is biased, and that gives you a distinguisher. Algebraic refutations are doing algebraic manipulation. Uh, and trying to derive a constraint one equal to zero, which is a contradiction. Uh, you can ask, can you can you somehow build an attack which utilizes both these properties? Try, yeah. Uh, Andre, do you want to say something? Sort of a more unified way to think of the two. So one way to sort of there is an alternative definition of the algebraic x. Sort of you split the part of the output. Each output bit is either one or zero. So I either take the one output or the zero outputs. And then sort of condition on some outputs being zero, I get some system of polynomial equations for each output. So I can kind of use this information that I know which outputs are one and which outputs are zero when I set the equations. So it's more general in that sense. But uh, is, is these results able to refute every such kind of attack? That reduces it to solving a system of polynomial equations over GF two. Yeah, Does so that is that? I I, th I thought there is uh, one of the questions that this paper um, left is uh, is an explicit. So if you look at the paper, they have an explicit question where they give giving another kind of attack which their uh, lower bounds do, does not capture. So there is more to it. Yeah, there is more to it. There definitely. Is, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, where was I? Okay, great. So uh, in order, so you need to choose uh, a nonlinear predicate which has high rational degree, which is actually enough. So you can choose ma uh, majority, which has the rational degree of d by two, and just uh, and this is just to kind of illustrate the gap. Here, 
Um, even if n to the d over two minus epsilon, we don't know of any heuristic attacks, including algebraic attacks. Uh, but the provable lower bounds uh, are only n to the d over 38. So there's a huge gap. And um, we'd like to understand why is that is it an artifact of the proof or uh, what can we do to fill this and explain what happens between. Okay, so let me end uh, this VRG segment on, on broad open questions. One of the open questions which I would really like to understand is that this uh, so far the way I've pre uh, presented is that there you start from an intuition of CSP and then things start to different uh, to differ that there is a that uh, we have to worry about algebraic attacks which do not exist in the CSP uh, landscape. Can you build a PRG which is at least as secure as a CSP, uh, random CSP with noise? Can you build a PRG which has this property and? That will actually rule out a lot of algebraic attacks if you can give a formal kind of relationship between the two. Um, another is this I've already mentioned, the tighter characterization. Uh, there are very few works uh, which um, on algebraic attacks. So can you actually give a tighter characterization? And uh, as uh, uh, there was a question just now about other attacks. So, uh, so if you can uh, analyze other kind of attacks, which uh, we have, haven't yet studied or we are yet to study. So in the, in the remaining time, let's, let me talk about another problem, which has played a major pivotal role in the construction of obfuscation, a fascinating uh, problem, learning parity with noise and has its roots back in 1950 to the work uh, on coding theory. Uh, so what does it say? It says that, you know, take a matrix A, think of it as a random matrix in dimension M cross N. So M is much more than N. So M, you're looking at a very tall and a thin matrix. Now, what do I do? Uh, and by the way, for the field, you can think of F2 or whatever field you want. Most uh, studied uh, setting is F2. Um, so then you multiply a secret S uh, from uh, ZP to the N and you take this combination. Now at this point, if I gave you A and this uh, combination A and S, uh, you, and I ask you to solve for S or decode S, it's really easy. You can simply run Gaussian elimination and solve for it. LPN is exact same question with an additional twist. What's the twist? I'm going to perturb a few of the, these samples with tiny const, uh, probability rho. Okay, so I'm going to do what I'm, how, how do I do this? I'm going to sample a vector E of dimension M where every coordinate is independently sampled to be random from ZP with probability rho. Uh, rho is some parameter. And with one minus rho, it's, going, it's set to zero. Okay, and I'll give you B and I ask the same question, given A and B, can you decode S for me? Now this rho is uh, typically a tunable parameter, zero to 0 0.99. Uh, and uh, this kind of governs what kind of hardness uh, do you get for this problem? So this is known as search uh, LPN. And note that um, you can actually find uh, secret S uniquely uh, as long as the number of samples M is large enough. How large? If you do some calculation, you can show that it needs to be linear in N. Uh, in cryptography, we study a weaker variant of this problem, or we use weaker variant of uh, this problem, which is known as decision LPN. Here, you want to distinguish A and B from A and uniform. Okay, instead of B generated this way, I give you a uniform. Okay, so what are the settings that are studied in cryptography or used in cryptography? Typically field F2, the, the sample complexity is uh, polynomial, although sub-exponential complexity is also used uh, in some of the constructions. And what about noise? Well, there are two uninteresting regimes. Uh, when the noise is one by n, here you could like simply guess n linearly independent equations and you can solve for it. So it's broken polynomial time. The other extreme when rho is one, in which case the problems, uh, the, the distributions become identical and there is no problem at all. Uh, so other than that, all other parameters have been uh, used in cryptography. So the most conservative setting is high noise LPN where the rho is constant. Uh, the best known algorithms here take close to exponential time. Uh, the intermediate problem, which is slightly more interesting in terms of applications, uh, low noise LPN, where the a noise is uh, one by into the delta, where delta is uh, some constant between zero and one. Just to give you a sense for IO, we need the setting of uh, one by n to the 0 0.001. I mean, the delta can be arbitrary constant greater than zero. 
Uh, and for public encryption, encryption, the best known schemes that we have uh, rely on noise uh, setting of n to the minus 0.5. Okay, and typically when the delta increases, the problem becomes easier and easier. Um, the best known algorithms in this regime are sub-exponential. Uh, finally, uh, also studied, uh, also used extremely low noise LPN where rho is uh, poly log n divided by n. Uh, and here the algorithms take uh, quasi polynomial time. So these are the typical settings. Uh, since we are working with, uh, since cryptographers care a lot about distinguishing problem, one thing really nice about this uh, problem is that this, there are decision and search equivalences. Um, actually, you can easily show that if you have a, a distinguisher, a powerful enough distinguisher, you can use it to actually search uh, for the secret. And the idea is the, just typically a basic extension of a simple idea, which I can just maybe tell you in a couple of minutes. Uh, the idea is that let's say I have a distinguisher and I want to guess the secret S or completely figure out the secret S and let's say the field is F2. Uh, I can take an LPN sample, which looks like A and AS plus E and A is A1 through AN. Uh, I can, you know, one bit by bit peel off uh, the secret and how. Let's say I want to guess the first bit of the secret and consider this uh, new, uh, new sample that I generate, which is A prime, which consists of the prefix of a from two to n, so really I removed a one from the vector, and I did on the right hand the other side a s plus e, which is what I had, and I subtracted off a one times s one uh, guess. Now the point is, if I uh, made a correct guess of uh, my secret, then it turns into another LPN in one dimension less. And if I made the guess wrong, then actually this becomes a random sample because a one was random. So if I have a distinguisher, you know I can. Uh, learn the secret bits one by one. Uh, and typically, you know, you need to boost this simple reduction many, many times to get more and more confidence on the secret. So reduction runtime and sample, sample complexity grows in this trivial argument. However, uh, there are sophisticated sample preserving uh, algorithms which do not, which have the large reduction time, but it doesn't have uh, such big of a sample complexity. And when it comes to algorithms, a lot, has, a lot of work has been done. All of those algorithms uh, typically are either algebraic or like semi-algebraic, but they have this algebraic flavor to it. Uh, and none of them actually far exceed the, the best running times uh, that I can, uh, that of an algorithm, which I'm going to tell you, an ex extremely simple algorithm, which is the guessing algorithm. So, in the guessing algorithm, uh, what do you do? You simply guess n errorless equations. Now, if the probability of error is rho, uh, you're able to guess n uh, errorless equations. The probability is one minus rho to the power n. And therefore, if you repeat it uh, one minus rho to the power minus n times, you get more and more probability of getting hang on the right errorless equations and solving using Gaussian elimination. If you plug in the values, when I choose rho as constant, I get two to the power order n. If I choose uh, rho to be one by n into the delta, I get two to the power uh, order n minus n to the one minus delta. And if I choose um, high noise setting, then I get a quasi polynomial time algorithm. So this is really surprising. This problem has been there for a long time. And actually, uh, if I just care about the asymptotic complexity in the exponent, uh, I can't do much better than this naive algorithm. Um, except one case, which I'm going to mention, which is this breakthrough result of Blum, Kala, and Wasserman. Uh, what do they do? Uh, they can show that, you know, you can solve constant rate LPN. If you can somehow increase the number of uh, samples to two to the N by over log N, which is really high, then you can solve this in the same time. So the run, this time in the sample complexity is N, uh, sorry, is N uh, two to the N over log N, therefore shaving off that log N factor. And the, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go over how the BKW algorithm works. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it offline though. Um, and, and actually this, this work was also a natural question to ask is what happens when I restrict the uh, sample complexity to polynomial n to the one plus epsilon. Then Lubyshevsky in 2005 showed that you can't get n to the, log I mean, it doesn't go all the way to n by log n. It goes to two to the n by log log n. Okay. And as far as I'm aware, with constant number of samples, uh, sorry, linear number of samples, we don't know any such 
results. So uh, another really important note, which is also one of the open questions, which I'm going to uh, say, is just this algorithm is very tailor-made for to work on F2. This somehow the kind of techniques that you, they're using uh, are very tailor-made to work on F2. In fact, we don't know any such implication when the prime fields are large. Okay. Uh, for IO, actually it turns out that we need the field to be sub-exponentially large. So all these kind of um, algorithms, they don't work in the setting that we are using. Okay, so with this, you know, let me end uh, at some open question. As I've been mentioning, we would like to understand what happens at large field. Surprisingly, even after so many years of uh, work, we know very little about this uh, uh, this problem. There have been uh, like um, all the all the other algorithms that we typically study are algebraic in nature. So, if there are other algorithms, we don't know about that. We don't know how um, hardness with respect to the primes with with respect to the fields rate does it become harder or easier if I choose the bigger prime? Uh, all those questions are uh, not yet clear. Uh, another very interesting direction which has come up recently is about worst case hardness. Here you want to prove that if you can solve this LPN, which is an average case problem, then uh, it's actually, you, you can use it to break some kind of uh, variance of nearest code word problems, which is a worst case decoding problem. So that's a really nice emerging direction. And there is a lot to be done in the, that space as well. So uh, yeah, other than, I'm happy to you know talk about these kind of things offline. So thanks for hearing, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, thanks for the very involving talk. Uh, I guess we can ask first question from the live audience, and then we can pass to Zoom if there are any. Right, um, the bilinear stuff. Uh, so altogether, there's a slide. Somewhere. Yeah, I can go back to that slide. It's... The elliptic curves. So yeah, these uh, there are two kinds of uh, directions. One uh, using pairing groups, and that has given this kind of assumptions. And this is still going on, and. Uh, Typically, on a very high level, they have a structure. So, LWE. So the, these are these. It's not that you need this and that. These are separate works. These are these are uh, two uh, two broad directions uh, that are popular right now in IRIS. They, most construction either fall in this category or that category. But you have more assumptions, no, than this. Uh, in which side? The these right. are two separate directions. Right. This on the, is the, on the on the right on the side on the left, I guess. Your on side. your side. On this side. Yes. So yeah, we did have LWE before, but now we recently showed in the new work that you you can get rid of LWE. You don't need it anymore. So, but but you have learning parity, parity with noise. noise. Oh, I see. So they differ. I'm confused. <laughs> so there are three assumptions there: uh, Boolean uh, PRGs in NC zero, learning parity with noise over ZP, and elliptic curve cryptography. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the reason the other side only has one is. It's because these guys also need the learning parity with noise? No, they no. just need the LWE plus plus. LWE plus okay. plus LWE and then some structured leakage on the errors. Okay. And that's, it. I mean, you know, this is very big zooming to, I don't know what, infinite levels, but that replaces uh, the learning parity with noise is, is used for some kind of a pseudorandom. Which part is for the pseudorandom number generation? Uh, Can you give us some idea of how? Which assumption serves what purpose? In yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, uh, for this line, uh, since you are using Balina maps, mm -hmm. we we can do degree two computations. Turns out, what we need to do is a PRG, which is comp which has short short input and a longer output, but it's actually be uh, computable in degree two. And somehow, this mixture of um, LPN, if you use LPN and you use a PRG in NC0, you can kind of combine them, them to build a PRG, which, is, which in the pre-processing model like has, can, be well, can be computed by, uh, by linear maps or in degree two. So that's why these two assumptions are used along with elliptic curves. In fact, if you had degree two PRGs, uh, which we don't know how to construct, in fact, they are impossible. 
then you can uh, remove the uh, then you can remove both these assumptions and all you need is uh, some kind of just degree two PRGs. Okay, and then you implement the other preferred. But what about uh, on the other side? The other side uses the power of uh, homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to evaluate a big circuit uh, using LWE style things you can evaluate. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, there is, uh, right. So then what you want to do is you want to give a, sh a short kind of decryption key, which right. only enables learning uh, the output, the corresponding outputs of the truth table. Uh, and that short key is like some sort of leakage, which lets you, this leakage on the errors. So if you start the leakage, you're making an assumption of the partners. With the leakage, you're, you're able to figure out the answer. Yeah, if you did not have leakage, then it's secure. And leakage lets you, uh, gives you functionality, right. but then you have to make a new assumption that this leakage is okay to give. Right. Uh, so maybe some other question, maybe from the Zoom or the live audience. Uh, if I can, um, I want to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is Vinod. Uh, okay, I'm coming from the sky. Uh, so, so the first question I want to ask is, you know, um, the both lines of work on constructing I/O uh, seem to somehow rely on hardness of CSPs or random sort of solving random systems of polynomial equations, right? Do you have a sense that this is inherent or just sort of a quirk on the way and, you know, eventually, you know, uh, it'll just disappear? I guess what I'm asking is, is it worth spending the effort um, to study these random polynomial systems? Uh, if I'm a cryptographer, you know, will it stay forever or, you know? So uh, I, I think I, I will... Um probably take some of it offline because it's a long answer what I'm thinking, but uh, somehow it's uh, on a very high level. It seems that uh, the, the Boolean structure, even if you design these polynomials, if the Boolean structures, are, uh, the, the kind of Boolean function, um, the, I mean, every polynomial is at, at the end of the day, uh, will have some kind of uh, uh, like a monomial pattern and that monomial pattern uh, in some sense, uh, in some of the settings which I was thinking about transforms to certain kind of Boolean functions. And if those Boolean, I mean, okay, just to put it another way, uh, the polynomials that arise typically um, in some of the things that I was trying out transform into uh, like give rise to some kind of Boolean uh, functions. And if those functions end up being easy, then you can use that to attack those, the polynomial systems. And uh, I, I'm happy to, you know, explain to you in what I, I'm trying to say. So I, in my, I would suspect that there are some connections, but it's too early to say like. Hmm. Uh, Necessary or not. Um, so I guess the other question I have is sort of a more details question. So you mentioned the BKW algorithm, right? Um, so, uh, you know, if you try to run BKW over a large field, but a uh, field of characteristic two, uh, shouldn't it just work, you know, like, uh, because, you know, an equation over a characteristic, over a large characteristic two field is just many equations in, 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 in you know, like mod two, right? Um, so that should just work, right? Uh, yeah, although I'm not sure how the ring structure, trans because uh, like this, it's typically F2X divided by some polynomial and uh, mm -hmm. the multiplication will kind of, uh, I'll have to think some more, but it's plausible. I'll, maybe I can think offline and get back. Thanks. Okay, so we are at the end of time. We can take uh, the rest of the questions offline. Uh, thanks, Agnes, again.